Welcome to the You Can Make a Living in the Music Industry podcast from Nashville, Tennessee. I am your host, John Martin Keith. Celebrities, working class musicians, and people who work behind the scenes in all areas of the music industry will share their stories, encourage you, and give practical advice of ways you can make a living doing what you love in the music industry. This episode is brought to you by Eden Brook Productions. Eden Brook Productions is the company I founded to help musicians grow in their craft. Are you a songwriter, but maybe you've been told your songs aren't quite there yet? Or are your songs ready, but you don't feel stage ready? Or maybe music is your passion, but you feel imprisoned by your day job and you don't know what to do next to make your dream a reality. Well, Eden Brook Productions is here to help. We offer consulting services via phone call, Skype, and FaceTime. And for the You Can Make a Living in the Music Industry podcast listeners, we're offering an introductory one-hour consultation special. Click on the link in the show notes to contact me, and let's get you making a living in the music industry. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show today. This week, I'm talking with Julie Klinger, who is the executive director of the Christian Festival Association. Julie oversees 25 festivals around the country. We are discussing what the CFA does, the importance of volunteers to make music festivals of any genre successful, how to start your own local festival, and what artists who want to perform at music festivals need to do to make sure that they are invited back. Please enjoy my conversation with Julie Klinger. Hey everyone, I am talking with Julie Klinger. Uh, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and she is the executive director for the Christian Festival Association. Hi, Julie. How are you today? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I am excited to talk with you. I know we've we've worked on this, trying to get it put together for about a month or so now, and um, we just finally finally able to get it together. So thank you for coming on the show. I'm excited to talk with yeah. you and learn more about what you do with the Christian Festival Association. And, um, you know, one of the things real quick before we kind of get into it, but one of the things I want people to understand is with a podcast, you know, it's not when we do certain topics or certain genres, it doesn't necessarily reflect just that one genre. So you and I do Christian music and we're kind of living that in that world for Mm -hmm. the most part. But when you're talking about festivals, you know, I think. Uh, John Doherty, who is a mutual friend of ours, and he's been on the show. He's a he's a director of Life Fest Music right. Festival up in uh, mm-hmm. Wisconsin and down here in Nashville, and um, and Matt Roberts also with uh, Jeff Roberts and Associates is uh, another friend of ours that ha- we got connected because of those guys, and um, you know. But when you work in a genre of music in the business, it doesn't necessarily reflect just that one genre. It kind of, it, it relates kind of across the board, no matter really for what, whatever you do, you know, we work in the Christian music world for the most part, but you know, it applies just as much in the mainstream, you know, music world as well. Agree. Would you agree? agree? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, tell us, who Julie Klinger is, where you're (laughs) from, um, what got you into music and, and a part of, um, being a, the executive director for the CFA. And we say CFA throughout, throughout the interview, we're not talking about Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Right. That's probably, you probably get that a lot. Um, but we're talking about the Christian Christian festival association. Uh, please tell us about your story. Okay. Well, it's kind of a bittersweet story, but, um, little fun fact um, when I was in junior high didn't have I mean my father was a choir director I grew up with music my mother was a pianist and singer and all of us girls sang in choirs and so we were all part of music growing up but little thing I didn't realize when I was in junior high in Mitchell South Dakota is a corn palace don't know if you ever heard of the world's only corn palace but um, there is a building called the Corn Palace in that yeah, town. I think I have. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, every year they would have the Corn Palace Festival, and there was this this teenage kind of teeny bopper band um, called the Keen Brothers way back when. I'm not going to date myself and tell you exactly how old I am, but I am kind of old. Um, anyway, I was a groupie. I kind of stood outside of the back of the door there waiting to meet the Keen brothers and so excited about meeting the Keen brothers. And little did I know that as I would grow up, I would start working with all sorts of various artists and yeah. meeting all sorts of people. So I guess maybe somewhere ingrained in me as a junior high 
girl, I really wanted to be around music and, and musicians and artists, but that's just kind of a weird little off, offshoot story. But um, yeah, I just, I always sang in choir and worship teams and just different things. And I didn't really know about Christian music at all, per se. I just love music in general and would go to different concerts and festivals and stuff like that. But a dear friend of mine who was um, two years ago passed away from cancer um, introduced me to uh, my very first music festival, and that was Sunshine Music Festival in Wil Wilmer, Minnesota. And I went and I was hooked. Um, just the festival experience itself doesn't really matter if it's a Christian or a mainstream festival. It doesn't really matter. Um, just that environment of being outside with your friends yeah. and hanging on the blanket and listening to different music. And the one thing I love about Christian festivals is it's life changing and it brings a lot of people into, you know, a, an eternal relationship with the Lord that, you know, makes a big, big difference in their lives. But um, so that was my first taste of it. And then some friends of ours from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approached us and said, hey, and we were all going to the same church at the same time. And they said, hey, would you guys want to help us start a festival in Sioux Falls? And we're like, well, sure. Only could hope that it could be the size of Sunshine, which at that time was 10,000 people. And little do we know that that Life Flight Music Festival will grow to be the largest free Christian music festival in the country where we had upwards of close to 100,000 people at it. So that 10,000 people crowd turned into like a 100,000 people crowd. Um, and through my nine years of volunteering and being involved in that festival, it kept moving because it kept growing <laughs> beyond the borders of where we had it. And then finally... Um, it landed in, in, in a big cornfield in South Dakota, and it could, you know, hold a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but I, after nine years of volunteer, left my um, job as a social worker and went to be the festival director and eventually became a vice president of operations. And um, so kind of ended up on some of the administrative side, but also on the festival directing side and got to do that for many, many years. And um so I ran a festival myself. So that's why uh, that kind of opened up the doors for me coming in at some point when the former executive director decided to step down. He asked me to consider taking his place. And wow, let me ask you this real quick. Yeah. Let me uh, sorry, I want to, uh, let me interrupt you, but I, I have a question. Sure. Um, regard so Life Light. I've played Life Light years ago oh, and sure. loved it. That I think it was like yeah. 2004 ish. Mm -hmm. um, I, I played it that one and uh and had a great time with that but um so you're volunteering helping put this on right. and then all of a sudden you're the director of it right now did you have experience that allowed you to step into that position pretty easily or did were you guys were you kind of all learning it along the way as you were creating the festival and then yeah. as you had done it for so many years you know just kind of learned the the steps to become to take over and it just kind of like fell into place. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think the thing was just trial by error. I pretty much worked every position you could work or was aware of every area that we did. Yeah. Um, even down to tearing down the stage at three o'clock in the morning with mosquitoes swarming all over my head and them giving me some ratchet thing saying, undo this bolt. And I had no idea how to do it, but there weren't enough volunteers at that yeah, time to it's take kind down of the trial stage. By fire, so, yeah. yeah, you pick up garbage, you work children's areas, you you know, you pretty much just need to work the festival in different areas and you know, everybody wants to work with the artists, but really that's the last place I ended. Um, that was the last job I had before I became the director was managing the artist relations activities. Um, but I had worked pretty much every area. I don't know how intensely I worked parking, but I definitely knew enough about parking. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. But yeah, you know, um, just learning it, we, it grew. It started just with a couple thousand people. And as you grew to hold the infrastructure for basically building a new small city on a farm, you know, you kind of learn a lot of different things and you have to work with county commissions and you have to do a lot of different things that you wouldn't have probably known had you not had some of those previous experiences. So I, you know, having a degree in social work, didn't necessarily know how to event plan, but um, a lot of what you do as a director is manage people, not just activities. We have to really find the good people that can lead their people. You know, when you're right. doing a big event like that, you kind of, 
you have to think of it like you're the mayor and you've got different committees, right? That lead different people working for your committee and then report back to the, the leader. And that's pretty much how I set up the small city is I really had different levels of leadership um, and trusted every leader to, to lead their area. And then they just reported back to me and we would have executive team meetings, kind of like you would have a city council meeting, right? Right. Um, and so then I just picked really high quality people to lead those areas that I saw rising stars of volunteering for many years as I was a volunteer. You just, you know, try to find those people that you think really shine. And when they shine, you put them in leadership positions and you trust them to lead. Right. Um, and you don't micromanage and you, um, it's really about honoring the volunteer and really lifting them up and elevating them when you see them shine. Um, that makes the world a difference and you can't run a big event like that without volunteers because it would cost way too much money to hire the thousand people that you need to run a big city like that for three days. So, yeah. yeah. When you, so when you're in that position and you're bringing, you're hiring volunteers or bringing people on to do those things, um, do you, do you look for people that are qualified in those in those positions already, or, I mean, you can't, you started it from a volunteer position. You didn't right. know what you're doing. You kind of learned it along the way. So when you are bringing in volunteers, are you looking for people that already know what they're doing or does that really matter to you? Because you know that people can, can figure it out and it's more about the personality and the, the person itself, as opposed to the, yeah. no, knowing the part to play necessarily. We always used to kind of say that God qualifies the called right. instead of calls the qualified. Right. And in a lot of ways, that's true. Um, there were some definite positions in operations and risk management that I sure. kind of needed some experienced yeah. people, especially sound when you're talking and- about, yeah, yeah, sound and production, safety planning, you know, high risk management kind of things. Um, certainly in operationally setting up the systems, the electricians and plumbers, there were definitely some trades that were needed for certain positions, but yeah. a lot of, if you were willing to learn and you were willing to work, you know, different things, I saw that. And, um, other leaders would recommend different people too. We were always, you know, on the hunt trying to, um, find those rising stars. And then also it became sort of a generational thing. So my child was raised, <laughs> you know, yeah. going to this festival. And so, so were the other leaders children. And so you'd start seeing the children step in and doing what the parents did. And that was really cool. I started feeling old, but, um, (laughs) that's okay. It was cool to see the baton pass to some of the younger, more energetic, you know, people (laughs) as you get older, it's, it's a lot of work. So sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so how many years were you leading life light before you became the executive director for CFA? Um, I'm trying to think here. I nine years I was okay. on staff um, as the festival director. Prior to that, I had volunteered ten years, so nineteen total years with Lifelight. Okay. And then I left for a different opportunity um, with another event company, and uh, about a year and a half, two years later, was approached to take over the CFA. Um, the executive director of the CFA really can't run a festival because we have to be non-biased and and uh, make sure that we're uh, representing all festivals evenly and not necessarily connected to one or the other because that would right. sort of that could lead to a conflict of interest. Sure. So I am not currently running a festival. I just have that 19 years of experience working with a festival. Right. Um, to know kind of some of the things that uh, my festivals need to support them as they continue to manage and operate their events. Okay. So regarding um, the Christian Festival Association, how many festivals, so for the audience to know, how many festivals are a part of that association that you are the director over all of that? 25 right now. Yeah. 25 across the country. Correct. And what's the difference? Well, tell us your what your role is as executive director, what do you do? Um, Because like you said, you can't run a specific one. You're kind of managing 25 of them, right? To a degree, Um, putting it all together, you know, kind of watching over everybody 
you know, from 30,000 feet, I guess. So Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what your role is, what your job description as executive director? Sure. Um, It's really to maintain and support um, the efforts that each of them do. So every year we have an annual meeting and I plan that meeting and gather different um, industry people together. And we go to different showcases. We learn from other industry people. Um, and then throughout the year, we I usually schedule um, week or monthly calls where we connect. And um, if there's an issue, they share they share their issues. Um, sometimes, especially during COVID, we were together almost every week, just praying and trying to support one another through that shutdown. And um, so, mainly, really networking and education. And then we also I also work with sponsors, national sponsorships that maybe want to sponsor all of the festivals for their brand. Um, okay. And so then I work with that to, to supply some resources to our festivals if they'll, you know, um, let that sponsor come into their event and maybe get some screen time or have a booth or whatever that would be. Um, and we're starting a new um, thing now where we're moving into more of a nonprofit status where we'll start looking at some donations and some national efforts of co-ministering along with other um, nonprofit organizations to do some cause, some cause um, marketing and some cause um, efforts to support other ministry ministries across the country to um, utilizing our platform. So I think our reach, um, to the Christian fan and the crowd, um, those are definitely potential hands and feet people that can get out and help those nonprofits. So we're looking at expanding and changing just a little bit to head in that direction, okay. um, a little bit more beyond just the sponsorship that we offer. Okay. Um, so when you're working with all the different festivals and you're, you know, you're doing your, your meetings with everyone and encouraging everyone and kind of, you know, I think everybody, everyone's probably picking each other's brains on how to make their mm-hmm. festivals better, right? Right. Um, yeah. What are some of the things for for audience listeners to know? Because I'm, I'm I'm hoping that there are people listening that want to be involved with a music festival. Want to be, you know, they want to yeah. work for one, or they want to start one, or however that works for them. Mm-hmm. Um, or or for festival people that want to work with other festivals, you know, um, what are some of the things that you guys, if I can ask you this, if you can talk about it, what are some of the things that you, that the different festivals all discuss? Like, what are some of the things that are problem areas that you're all trying to make better? Maybe what are some things that, you know, everyone's doing a really good job at that other people that, that are listening to this could benefit from maybe. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. I think there are various things. I think, you know, specifically looking at their own communities and trying to reach out and learn from other people, like how do they draw in more um, support from their community? How do they engage their community more? How do they support their community back in return? Um, And, you know, obviously the CFA is an umbrella, so it represents a larger national scope, but every festival individually has their own community that they're a part of. And for anybody looking at a festival or starting a festival or being a part of a festival, I think the key thing is community and engaging the community. Um, It's really hard to launch a festival without a lot of community involvement um, and buy-in from the community, whether that's businesses or churches or it doesn't, you know, depending upon what type of, of festival that you're doing. And then finding those volunteers is pretty key too. Um, to really making something be a success in your town um, or your region. Um, People just really want to be a part of something bigger than themselves, and they want to make a difference. And so when you provide a way for everybody to come together in community and and enjoy that time together yet, but also – give back to the community through either funneling volunteers back into organizations or maybe finances back into our organization or um, having a service project where people are specifically going to get involved with something um, that shows the community that this event actually is invested in the community. It's not just trying to take from the community, but it's giving back. And that's one of the things that made life light successful was engaging the churches and the businesses and, um, just different people um, to support something and come together. I always kind of think of it as a full circle where the festival 
launches, different things happening throughout the year. And then it all kind of feeds back into festival season and it comes back out and feeds back in and comes back out and feeds back in. And if you're not doing that and you're just stopping at a place to have a fun little event and then not doing anything beyond that, um, those festivals usually struggle. So I think that's what we try to pride ourselves in as a CFA is that that giving back element and mm-hmm. that engagement element element in the community. So what are some things, just to expand on that particular point, what are some things that you would suggest mm-hmm. that festivals do outside of the festival season, that kind of the other part right. of the year to circle back around until it gets back to that? What are some things that... Um, that people that are putting festivals on could be doing within the community to kind of keep things going? Yeah, I think that there are ways that they, it depends on who they have at their festival or who they're partnering with on those causes. But um, I've seen different festivals do mission trips out of their festivals where they go do missions in different parts of the country or different countries. Um, We've partnered on a national level with um, Eight Days of Hope and they go into disaster communities and help um, rebuild those communities. Um, it's getting out into your churches and, and just really trying to either supply something back. Maybe it's a pulpit supply or it's, um, doing something with those youth group kids or bringing in more shows throughout the year to do more ongoing ways to get people together to gather. Um, so it's a little bit both, um, ways of building that community, bringing people together with other things throughout the year, or actually engaging our fans and our festival fans back into their community by having them serve in different capacities and ways. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Um, what are some, what are some things, I mean, you're already giving amazing advice, so I appreciate that. Um, what are, if someone wanted to work kind of get their foot in the door at a festival of any kind <laughs> what is what would be the first step to do that i think like, the I just, first step, like i don't yeah. even have like like I, i'm i'm the person <laughs> who wants to get involved and work at a festival i have no idea what i'm doing um i have no idea what the possibilities are but i want to just be involved in a festival and like mm-hmm. who who do i reach out to where do i start and how do i do that yeah, I think the best thing to do is, is volunteer. Just start volunteering and getting to know the festival and the people that run it. And the more you're willing to volunteer and do extra things, being extra committees, the more people that are on staff at those festivals notice your abilities and your skills. And not to come on too strong, but also just to, to really be supportive and just and really honestly, just whatever job they need you to do, be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I even had, you know, it's, I still remember this. I had artists that would come in and volunteer in my parking lots. The artists would, you know, so if artists can volunteer in a parking lot, certainly we can, right. Um, and just to even try to help get the word around. Um, I used to have this kid on Facebook and now he works at Nashville. It's really funny, but he would, he was almost our best street team kid. He would just advertise and talk about Lifelight all the time. Sometimes you just sort of like stop telling people stuff before we do. I don't know how he'd find out the information. I tease him to this day about it. Now he works for an agent in Nashville, but um, <laughs> just, just, you know, there are kids like that. You have like, you can look at those social media influencers and, and people that can help get the word out. And um, we pay attention as festivals to who's talking about us and, and volunteers that are showing up at those meetings and really being engaged and really following through with what they say they're going to do, because we have to trust volunteers. We can't, when they're not on staff, they're not under your roof every day for you to keep track of. So you really are stepping out in faith and trusting that the volunteer that says they're going to do something does it because if they don't do that, then that's kind of like the whole body, right? Something's off whack and, um, and it can't operate if it's, it's not working. So it's very hard as a leader to trust somebody who you haven't heard from or is not engaging. I'm usually going to pull that job from them, but if they're there and they're engaged and they're following through and they're giving reports back, they're achieving their, you know, to-do lists, that kind of stuff. Those are things that 
you know, any leader notices and goes, okay, that volunteer is awesome. I want more people like that. I could have like five volunteers like that instead of, you know, 50 volunteers that aren't really engaged. Sure. So, you know, I think those are all things that you do to get noticed. The only way to learn how to do a festival is to volunteer for one and just work it from behind the scenes yeah. in the different areas um, and not go for the glamorous jobs right away. You know, <laughs> work your, your, there's no real glamorous job, by the way. Um, <laughs> right. Some people think there's glamorous jobs jobs, but there really isn't. Um, it, it's just, but it's really fun and it creates a new, it's definitely a sense of family. I remember that week of setup of that festival feeling like that was more of a family reunion than sometimes my own biological family. Like I couldn't wait to see, we had festival volunteers that came in from all over the country. They bring their campers, they drive up and oh my gosh, it was just so awesome. And that week, it was a hard week setting up a big city, you know, like that. But um, just to see those people come consistently keep coming back every year as a leader, that was just meant a lot, you know, to us. And they were definitely a family. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's a really cool experience to be part of as a volunteer for a festival. I can't recommend it enough. So Sure. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if someone wants to, they want to volunteer for a festival, who is the person that they need to reach out to at they, like yeah. do they go on the web on, on a what usually they go on a website is and there's like yeah. a place to just contact people and yeah um, actually you can go to christianfestivalassociation.com and we have all of the festivals that are part of the association right. yeah. listed there and then you can click on one near you or wherever you want to go and there should be a volunteer or get involved with tab on everybody's website. They do all, they're all operated independently. So they make their own choices of who does what, you know, independently. Um, we network together and combine resources as much as we can. But as far as um, their operations, um, their production, all that kind of stuff, that's all independently operated. So you would want to go volunteer. Um, it's interesting though, but we had, we would have volunteers that, would show up at several of the festivals. Like they almost would drive around the country for the summer cause they loved it so much. And yeah. several volunteers, once they get involved, they will go to several festivals and volunteer just cause they really like that opportunity. So, yeah. and then those are definitely people you want when you're a festival manager, because if they've had prior experience in a certain area at a festival, you're going to snatch that up pretty quick. So, yeah. so yeah. if, if someone wants to work, for a festival, like mm -hmm. I, I want to get on staff at a festival and actually be, you know, have a position there. Um, that's, that's got a salary or however, however that works for the festivals. Um, do you typically bring people into those positions after, because they've been volunteers, like, do they kind of get first pick? Um, do you see that as being a thing or, or do you reach, are you guys putting out, you know, uh, not ads, but, you know, putting out feelers for people that say, Hey, we've got this position open. We need to fill this position. It's a paying position for the festival and, you know, send us your resume or do you have a kind of a preference to how you bring people in or that festivals bring people in that you know of? I think it's both just from my experiences, hiring different people. Um, sometimes I would need an accountant, you know, at the organization. So yeah. that nece wouldn't necessarily, maybe it was a volunteer that volunteered in the offering and um, finance department of the festival. But um, it's, it, it would be a combination of both things, actually. Um, I was certainly hired because I was a volunteer who just rose up to the the occasion when I was needed. I just did things that I didn't even know I was you, I could do. And my leader saw that and hired me, you know, down the road. I, I did not go into it with ever an intention of doing that. Um, I loved being a social worker and I loved running my adoption program and I loved the festival, but that was kind of my part-time giving back to my community thing, you mm -hmm. know, and it ended up just being an opportunity that fell into my lap and one that I felt God was leading me to do. So I did it. Um, other people, you know, there are event management degrees and different things that people can do to get some of those, um, production degrees, all of those things that get you definitely good experience that festivals could notice. A lot of our festivals are run by real skeleton staff and mostly just go by volunteers, honestly. Um, some of them are larger and have many staff. So it just depends. Not all festivals hire a lot of people. Some of them yeah. maybe have two or three people on staff and the, and the rest of them are all volunteers. Yeah. So 
Um, you could also work for various festivals. There are festivals, you know, that are a lot larger um, in different areas of the country too that probably have more of an ability to hire on staff, but we like uh, what we do and, and the great messages that go out from our stages, obviously. So, sure. um, so thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, so for people that are artists or speakers, um, and want to come and be involved with a music festival, they want to perform at one on mm-hmm. some level. Um, how do you guys typically, now that's not your position necessarily, because right. I know that you're kind of overseeing, 25 different festivals, but can you give some, some insight on how festivals typically for people listening that are artists that want to, or speakers or whatever that want to get in to a festival, how would you tell them that what steps do they need to take in order to hopefully get their foot in the door to be able to perform at a festival sometime? That's like the million dollar question. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we get asked it all the time. Um, it, you know, it can be done in a variety of ways. You know, some of the festivals have like um, talent search things or a stage where they really just dedicate it to different new talent. Um, otherwise, most of the booking goes through different agents in Nashville. And if you're connected with that agent, then you can tell your agent that you want to work festivals and they can start promoting that to you, to a, to a festival. But not we, we like to discover new talent. We like to support new talent. We like you know, sometimes it's a local connection where a band is kind of on the rise locally that the festival will put them on stage, but, um, emailing and trying to call and, um, it's hard. There's a lot of bands trying to do that. I get it, but, um, you never know what gets you noticed. So you just got to keep trying. And if you have any representation, that's the person that should be reaching out on your behalf as an artist. But, um, honestly go volunteer <laughs> show up and then somehow just ask hey if you got a time we like to just even share at the bonfire in the campground or those things get you noticed i know sure. people don't like to hear that but sometimes it's just doing that servant work um i noticed that in a heartbeat and i would bring some bands back every year just because they had that servant heart and i could see it and i didn't care if they had a ma- manager or an agent or whatever So that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have that. Um, But there's a combination of what some state, you know, some of our festivals are one day, they maybe only have five slots. So most of them are probably going to go to those, you know, industry slots, but you, you know, you never know. Um, So you just have to reach out and do some of that grunt work and go visit and get to know people and, and form relationships. And that's what gets you in the door. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, I know you got another meeting you got to go to here pretty soon, so I don't want to keep you. Um, so as just kind of as we wrap up here, what's um, what's some advice that you would give people? What are some things to stay away from if you're trying hmm. to work in the festival, whether it be as, <laughs> you know, coming in as a volunteer, kind of getting your foot in the door that way, or as artists and, and talent coming in to perform at different festivals, what are what are things that will get people not invited back in the future oh, <laughs> to okay. avoid? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I was taking it from a different perspective. Well, you take it like... however you need to. You bring it to me, whatever you're thinking. <laughs> um, from the festival plan, I'm going to take it from both angles. Okay, okay? sure. Um, as a festival planner, I think the biggest mistake I've seen made, and I have made it myself, is over planning. Um, when you're starting a festival, you've got to give it three years to even get noticed. And if you plan three days and five stages and you book all these artists your first year, and you might be lucky if you get 2000 people there, you know, that's a great year. You know, your first year, it takes so much to build an event and to keep it building. Um, you have to have a three-year plan of sustainability before it's even probably going to start really generating, not just financially for you, but crowd wise. And so people can tend to, oh, I'm gonna bring a festival and everybody's gonna wanna come. Well, but how are you gonna tell everybody about it? (laughs) And you can't count on the churches telling everybody about it. That's not necessarily gonna happen. So uh, unless you've got lots of marketing money and a built-in millionaire that's gonna give you lots of money to tell everybody about it, um, it's tough to start one 
Uh, you have to do that grass rut stuff. You have to go knock on doors and hold babies. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it's not, it's not an easy process initially. So if you're trying to start one, start it simply, start it conservatively and work on your relationships and build it slowly. Best piece of advice I can give from an operational side, Thank from an artist side of things not to do, um, really don't ignore your promoter. You know, we work all year round and we really just like to know your heart. So sometimes when you show up and you just sit on your bus or you don't ever come out and talk to anybody or you won't do meet and greets or you won't really engage with our fans because our fans are their fans and we have to keep them coming back too. So um, there's, there's a lot to be said about you engaging as an artist with the festival, you promoting the festival yourself to your fans to get them to come, um, but also engaging with the promoter because we work real hard. We have to raise that money. We have to pay the artists. Um, they're not free. They're never free. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's a Christian festival or a mainstream festival. Um, artists deserve to be paid. They have to run their their lives and their businesses like anybody else. And um, But... I, if you're being paid for a job, typically you appreciate your employer or you make sure that you acknowledge who's, you know, paying you. Right. Um, so I think sometimes that gets overlooked, like they come onto the property and I get that it's traveling is hard and you've got to go lots of different places, but at least try to acknowledge the promoter, reach out, um, serve in some way, the promoter, whether that's just blessing that person and talking to them or, um, like I said, maybe you're going to go serve in some way or capacity, whatever that is. But um, the artists that really have attitude and aren't seen and just hide away and just act like they're, you know, really sort of inconvenienced by the fact that they're at your event probably aren't going to get a lot of invitations back again. Yeah. Um, especially in the Christian music world, we're a small world. We're a small niche in the industry and we all know each other. And, um, we really, we do tell people when we really, really like somebody. I don't know if we, we don't talk about you. Maybe that's not great. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be talked about in right. a good way. And I'm right. not saying that people don't talk bad yeah. about each other. That hopefully isn't the case. But yeah, you know, Christians aren't perfect. So I can't say that either. But yeah, definitely just do your best to honor who has brought you there. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate that. And yes, especially as, as Christians and Christian doing Christian music festivals, um, when we as believers, as artists come in and act unbecoming of what a Christian is supposed to be at a Christian music festival, that is not a good look. <laughs> it's right. not, that's the opposite well, of what we're supposed to be, you yeah. know, portraying and, yeah. you know, representing. So, um, right. But yes, yeah, so I, I agree with that completely. So, well, and we Julie, can learn. We can learn too, because um, sure. sometimes some of our festivals obviously aren't perfect either. And so we, I personally like that feedback. I like it when an agent calls me and says, "I need to talk to you about something that happened," mm. because I can reach out and say to that festival, "Hey, this was an experience that didn't go well with the artist." So we can go two ways. People aren't perfect, and there yeah. can be different people that are maybe not recommend representing the festival, like the festival operators would like to have that happen too. So uh, it's not just an artist thing. It's a two way street. So. Yeah. I mean, and do you guys encourage artists represent artists or the representatives yeah. to reach out to you guys when there is an issue so that you can sure. see, yeah. Hey, we need to make this better. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We have a code of ethics and conduct under the CFA. So we really want to hear those things if something yeah. happens. Yeah. So, and we'll address it in the best way we can. So that's great. Yep. Well, this has been great. I, I hate that we had to cut it short because it's, it's a wonderful conversation, but I know you got other things that you got to take care of. So I'm going to let you go. But I just want to say thank you again, Julie, for coming on and talking about the CFA and, and just festivals in general and what you do with them. This has been fantastic. And I think that um, for people that want to get involved with festivals on any any level, this would be a perfect starting starting place for them to learn about it. And, figure out how they need to get involved. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. You have a great day. Yep, you too. All right. All right, guys, there you have it. I hope you had a great time listening to our conversation today. I hope you take what we've talked about today and find ways to apply it to your career as well. Please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on. And please share it with all of your friends so that we can continue to get this message out to everyone around the world. 
Remember, Edenbrook Productions is here to help if you need consulting services via phone, Skype, Zoom, or FaceTime. Let us know how we can help you begin to make a living in the music industry.